Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with the third lecture on transient heat conduction. Transient means the temperatures changes as a function of time. We've started with the simplest approach, which is called the lump system approach. We've derived the equation for it, and we've done an example, and I've spent a lot, a lot of time trying to explain to you what is the limitations of the lump system approach and when it should be used. And I hope it will become clearer to, to you as we go through the chapter, because it is very important. So we've completed the lump system approach, and then we've started paragraph 4.2, uh, paragraph 4.2 in the textbook of heat and mass transfer of Sengel and Kajar, the fifth edition. And paragraph 4.2 is on large plane walls, long cylinders, and spheres. And there's a derivation that I'm going to show to you today. Not all the detail, just the most important steps, and then the solution. And we're going to discuss the solution of the specific case of the large plane wall. Now take note, the large plane wall derivation is shown in your textbook, but the derivations for the cylinder and spheres are not given there, just the results. Okay. So, how do, so what is the methodology which is being used to solve the temperature distribution in a large plane wall? So this is the large plane wall, and the boundary conditions, as you can see, there's a symmetri symmetrical boundary condition, this is always given as 2L. If you want to, you can rederive everything and you can do it as a function of L. But th this is how it was done by the people who did it for the first time. So they rather use that as 2L. And then on both sides, we've got heat transfer coefficient and T infinite, where the temperature at T equals zero is equal to Ti. So we are interested to see how the temperature changes in this body as a function of time. And if you just look at this, you can see that this is what makes this solution different from the lump system approach. Because in the lump system approach, if you calculate the temperature, it's the temperature everywhere. Okay. And this is more accurate. So firstly, we've looked at the energy equation yesterday, and we've said that there are no changes in the y direction and in the z direction because it's insulated. So this large plane wall is insulated on, on this end as well as in that end, as well as in the front and in the back. So four corners or sides of insulation. So the heat transfer rate can only be, and that is our coordinate scale x, it can only be in the x direction. So it's a one dimensional problem. Therefore, if we look at the energy equation, those two terms must disappear. And the other thing is we're going to make the assumption that the thermal conductivity of this material is constant. Of course, that would not always be valid. For example, if you've got composite materials, then the thermal conductivity is, is, is not so simple. But in general, it is a good assumption. So the moment we can have that as a constant, we can simplify this equation to k partial 2t dx squared is equal to rho c multiplied by partial dt dt. The one t for temperature and the other t for time. Oh, I forgot to mention, of course, yesterday we also said that term is also equal to zero because there is no nuclear reactions in the wall and nothing that generates heat, a chemical reaction or anything like that. So we can immediately see our equation is much simpler. And here we've got a constant and there we've got a constant. So we can get rid of it by writing partial d2t dx squared is equal to 1 divided by alpha multiplied by partial dt dt, where alpha is equal to k divided by rho c, and that is called the thermal diffusivity. Thermal diffusivity, and as you can see, it is just all the material constants which are taken together. And the c, of course, is the cp of the material. 
Right, so this equation, we're going to refer to it as equation one. How do we solve that? Well, we have to take into consideration the certain boundary conditions. Okay. First boundary condition that we can use is to say that the temperature gradient at all those points is equal to zero. So, all those points there, we can say that is boundary condition one. Boundary condition one says that partial dt at any point xt dx is equal to partial dt and now we're talking of where x is equal to zero and that is equal to zero because we've got a zero temperature gradient in the center of the wall. So that's the first boundary condition. The second boundary condition that we will need to solve this partial differential equation is to use uh, the conditions on the side because that should be the heat transfer of conduction is equal to the heat transfer rate of convection. Okay. So we can write it in terms of the conduction heat transfer as K multiplied by the area multiplied by the temperature uh, sorry uh, dt dx minus k area multiplied by partial dt dx or differential equation of uh, dt dx as a function of x and t and that must equal, be equal to the convection heat transfer and the convection heat transfer is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area multiplied by the temperature and it will be the temperature at L where x is equal to L T minus T infinite okay. so this is our boundary condition 2 on the wall the conduction heat transfer is equal to the convection heat transfer take note the temperature inside obviously when we start it is equal to Ti but then the temperature decreases so that is why we cannot use Ti it is the temperature that varies as a function of time right the then we also need an initial condition because we've got time in this equation one and the initial condition will be the temperature is equal to where x is equal to zero okay. is equal to ti so the initial condition is the fact that the temperature there is equal to ti so partial differential equation two boundary conditions one initial condition however yep question is the ti little the same ti as the one we started with? yes so ti is the temperature it's a uniform temperature at the beginning okay so when t is equal to zero so if t is equal to zero then the temperature everywhere is equal to Ti and obviously at the center also uh, sorry okay thank you yeah uh, x uh, zero is that right okay so when time is zero the temperature is equal to zero at actually all x values okay right now a very simple partial differential equation but with all these variables nobody so far can solve it can be solved however you use you have to use a little bit of a trick 
And the trick is to look at this equation and to say, well, let's see if we can make it easier. And we make it easier by non-dimensionalizing certain terms. Okay. And the first one is to have a space variable, which is capital X. And capital X would be equal to X divided by L. Okay. So a space variable, if we just look at this, means that if we are interested in the temperature at that point, then X would be equal to L. And then it would be equal to the non-dimensionalized value of 1. If we want the temperature at that point, x would be equal to 0, so it's 0 divided by L is equal to 0. Halfway through, that would be, that would be where capital X is equal to 0 0.5. Okay, so it's very simple. Then the dimensionalized temperature, the non-dimensionalized temperature, and that is equal to the temperature minus T infinite divided by Ti minus T infinite. And you will see that with a lump system approach, that is typically the temperature distribution that we've written down. And that is also a non-dimensionalized temperature. It means that the temperatures would always vary between 0 and 1. The next one is the dimensionalized time, which is called the Fourier number. It's a little bit confusing. In the textbook, sometimes it uses tau, and in other cases, it uses FO for the Fourier number. But it's the non-dimensionalized time. And the non-dimensionalized time is equal to alpha t divided by L squared. The Fourier number of the non-dimensionalized time. Okay. Now take note, this one can be much larger than 1. All the others would vary between 0 and 1. And then we've already defined the build number. And the build number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by a characteristic length divided by k. Take note. Take note. This characteristic length is nowhere here defined as the volume divided by the surface area. That was unique to the lump system approach. Okay. This L would be that distance. Okay. It might work out the same, but in many examples or problems it wouldn't be the same. So that is very important to remember that. Right, so now We've written everything into non-dimensionalized variables and immediately it would look as if everything is now more complex. But if we use these non-dimensionalized variables and we do the substitution into equation one, then equation one can be written as the partial to theta dx squared is equal to partial d theta d time. And we can also take these boundary conditions of us and we can also go and write them in a non-dimensionalized format. So dimensionalized, we are going to do boundary condition one, boundary condition two, and the initial condition one. So if we now stop for a moment and we ask ourselves why are we doing it, it looks as if we make everything more complicated, then the answer is no. Because before we non-dimensionalized everything, in comparison with after, okay, we had the situation where the temperature is a function of eight variables. And the eight variables would be x, L, T, K, 
alpha, the heat transfer coefficient, uh, Cp, rho, etc. Okay, so about eight variables. Temperature is a function of eight variables. After we've non-dimensionalized everything, the non-dimensionalized temperature is now a function of x, the build number, and non-dimensionalized time. So it's a, only a function of three variables. So that's the rationale for doing it. Now for a moment I want to make a break in terms of sort of a discontinuity. So I want to go back now to the lump system. To the lump system approach we've done in paragraph 4.1. So I want to stop for a moment and I want to go back to the lump system approach. If we now use these non-dimensionalized variables and we go and put it into that equation that we've derived for the lump system approach. You'll maybe you'll remember it's an equation typically like this. Uh, it's equal to E to the minus BT and B was something like the heat transfer coefficient, the volume and surface area, CP, uh, something like that. Okay. Question mark about it, you can go and write it out correctly. If we now use these non-dimensionalized variables and we go and substitute it in here and we play around with this a little bit, then it can be solved as the non-dimensionalized temperature is equal to E minus the build number multiplied by the Fourier number. So the non the temperature, the, the, the temperature equation previously as a function of time can be written in that simple format. Okay. So, okay. Now I continue. I continue with that work. Okay. So we step away now again from paragraph 4.1. We go back to paragraph 4.2. So let's continue with paragraph 4.2. Okay. Now in terms of Solving this equation, theta is a function of uh, x, theta and tau, x, theta and tau, there are more than one approach that can be used. The first one is the exact solution, to get the exact solution. And the second one is to get an approximate solution. An exact solution and an approx approximate solution. Now even with the exact solution there are different methods that can be, can be used to solve that equation with. But the equation, or in general, it is solved from equations 4. Point, uh, I think uh, 25 to 48. And it is done using the method of separation of variables. And you've done that in mathematics. And the result is that the results can be written as a Fourier series. Okay. I think most of you maybe cannot read here. So typically from equations, I think 425 or 445 uh, to 48, the derivation is given. The method is used separation of variables and it is written in a Fourier series format, the results. For the approximate solution, there is also a graphical solution. So the results can be written in a graphical format and the results of that is typically in equations 2.49 to 2.59. Now in terms of this separation of variables, I don't know if you can remember it, but typically you would say theta 
is a function of x and tau. It should be a function of f, where a function f is just a function of x multiplied by g, which is only a function of tau. Do you still remember that things, those things? Okay, so you've got a function which is only a function of x, another function which is only a function of tau. You can go through all the steps in solving it, and the solutions is going to work out in terms of, let's call it, three terms of, or three equations. The first one is that you're going to have the solution of alpha tan alpha is equal to a Biot number. Okay. And the Biot number will be a constant. However, this function has an infinite number of roots, so there's not only one solution. And that is called the characteristic equation or the eigenfunction. I've done it in mathematics. The characteristic equation or the eigenfunction. Then, as I've said, the results can then be written in terms of a Fourier, re <coughs> Fourier series where theta is equal to the sum where n is e from n equal 1 to infinite of a constant a n, and we're going to get to it just now, multiplied by e to the minus lambda n square tau multiplied by the cos of lambda n x, like that. Where a n is solved from the initial conditions, and that is equal to 4 times the sin of lambda n divided by 2 times lambda n plus the sin of 2 times lambda n. Okay. So it looks very complicated and it looks like an irritation if you have to go and solve this problem. Okay. So these are some of the most important steps that has been used to take note, give us a solution for the large plane wall only. This is not the mathematics and the solution for the cylinder and the sphere. That's not in the textbook. However, all the results are summarized in table 4.1 in your textbook. So if you can take a look at that quickly. So let me see if I can show this to you. They are. So I think it will be a little bit small there for you to read. If you've got your textbook here, uh, please take a look at it. Um, you will have to, you're going to use your textbook in the test and the exams. So most students, by the time you get to the test and exams, will put in tabs in their textbook. You can also consider that. Uh, so things like this will obviously not be given in the test and exams, so you need to get it from your textbook. At the back of the textbook, there are also many tables. Just like in thermodynamics too, you're going to do a lot of paging during the tests and exams, so you need to know exactly where things are. Now, the solution, very easy and quickly, However, what you have to be careful for is what I always call the fine print. And the fine print is given in this case underneath the table. Okay. So if you look at the fine print, typically, it would say here theta is given as t minus t infinite divided by t i minus t infinite. Okay. The Biot number is equal to H multiplied by L divided by K. So take note, it doesn't say H multiplied by the characteristic length LC, as you've calculated with the lump system approach. The L is the L of the plane wall. Or it is equal to H multiplied by R0 divided by K. So in the case for the cylinder and the sphere, it is R0. And the Biot number, there it is also given, it's equal to alpha, or tau is equal to alpha t divided by L square, or alpha t divided by R0 square. So underneath the fine print, 
very, very important. And the solution is therefore only valid for that very specific fine print. What you also need to look at is not only now below the table, so the results are all in table 4.1, you're going to use that table quite a lot, underneath it, it defines theta, it defines the biot number, how you should calculate it, the Fourier number or the tau number. However, students would very quickly look at that and say, yes, I'm right, I'm right for the test and exam. And then in the test or exam, in that table 4.1, you will see that the results are given for the large plane wall, it is given for the long uh, cylinder, and it is given for the sphere. Okay, the three equations. However, if you now start lo looking at these two equations here, you will see there's suddenly a J0 and a J1. And then students would ask you, what is this J0 and J1? Those are the Bessel functions. Okay, I hope you've done it in mathematics. So if you do the derivation, not for the plane wall, but if you take the geometry into consideration of the long cylinder and the sphere, the solution is more complicated and you need also the Bessel functions J0 and J1. And I will show to you a little bit later where those are. So, if we now just step back and look at what has been given to you. What has been given to you is a methodology where you can consider a certain body. And that body, obviously on the outside, will have temperature T infinite, and there will be a heat transfer coefficient. And <coughs> it will also have a certain CP value, a certain rho value, a certain volume, a temperature Ti, an alpha, which, always we take, which takes into consideration the Ke, the Cp, uh, the Ke, the Cp, and something else. I can't remember now. <laughs> yes, alpha is equal to K divided by rho Cp, okay, the thermal defensivity. And now I'm going to give you this problem and you're going to look at this and say, how am I going to solve it? Okay. Now the first thing that you will have to con look, consider is that there are solutions only for the large plane wall, the long cylinder and the sphere. So if the problem that you want to consider, if the geometry is aligned to this, then you can use one of these solutions in table 4.1. Now in some cases it wouldn't be exactly, but you can maybe make an approximation. Other cases it might be the exact one and then obviously it gives you the correct analytical equation. Now if you look at all these variables, as I've said there are eight variables, then we have to non-dimensionalize them. And we can do it, firstly we can go and see if we have theta the build number, tau, and x. Those are the three things. Okay. Now if we look at this, typically the x, if I ask you for the temperature at that point there, then x would be equal to 1. If it's in the center, it would be 0. So that is from the geometry. We can determine that. Okay. Now it doesn't mean in all cases you'll be able to, to get x. It might, there might be cases where that is given, that is given, and that is given. And it asks you at what temperature will the temperature be 100 degrees Celsius. Okay? Somewhere in the body. So it might be the other way around. Okay. Tau is going to depend on alpha and it is going to depend on the question how long. Okay. The build number has to do with the resistance of the body on the inside and the body on the outside. 
Okay. And theta is just a non-dimensionalized temperature difference. So normally, if a problem like this is given, you will be able to determine three of the four non-dimensionalized values. That's the important thing. Okay. Let's do an example. And the example is not going to be a very specific example, but the example is going to be a large plain wall. So it is going to be something like that. Large plain wall. Where the build number is equal to 5. Okay, build number is equal to 5. So in this, we will have a temperature Ti, we will have a Ke, a Cp, a Rho, etc. And on the outside, there will be T infinite and H. Okay. The build number gives us the ratio of the resistance on the inside and the resistance on the outside. That is what that value tells us. Okay. Then, tau is given as 0.2. So that's a non-dimensionalized time. The question might have been, determine a temperature on this surface after three minutes. Then you can calculate tau, tau. In this case, let's suppose it is equal to 0.2. Then x is given as 1. x equal to 1 means we want this solution on the surface. Now, if we want to solve this and we look at the eigenfunction, alpha n, ton alpha n should be equal to the build number and that should be equal to 5. The solution for this would be, the first solution would be 1.3138. Okay. The second one will be equal to 4.455. Uh, take note in the textbook it is equal to 4.0336. I think there's a misprint in the textbook. I think these values of mine are correct. Uh, and the next one at 7.597, etc. Every pi from each other because it's an infinite equation, the ton equation doing something like that and there are roots everywhere. So there are more than one root. Right, so that is equal to alpha n. Then we can go and calculate the a values. The a values would be equal to four times the sin of lambda n divided by two times lambda n plus the sin of two times lambda n. Okay. And again, we can go and calculate all the n values. So the first one will be equal like 1.2402. The next one is equal to minus 0.3442. The next one is equal to 0.1588. And then after that, minus 0.876, etc. I'm just writing down the first four terms. Right, now that we've got a in, we can go and calculate theta because the non-dimensionalized temperature is equal to A in e to the minus lambda n square the cos of lambda in x okay for all the lambda values for all the A values and the result is then the solution that would give us the, the first theta value as equal to 0.22321 plus 0.00835 plus 0.401 plus 0. more than five zeros and a value. So if we do it for a large number of terms, the solution would be equal to 0.23145. Okay. 
Now, if you are as lazy as I, and you look at this, and then fortunately people before me also immediately realized it, that if you go and look at the solution, okay, and once you've done many of these problems and you've compared it to each other, they have found that if the tau value is larger than 0.2, okay, then the error would be less than 2% if the first term only, first term only, is used. Okay. Right, so if you look at it critically you'll see that it is not necessary to do a large number of terms if tau is larger than 0.2. Okay. These days, of course, you can solve it very easily on your computer. In the old days, if the professors didn't like their students or they were too noisy in the class, they would go and tell them, go and solve it for me for the first 10 terms or something like that. Okay. Right. Now, coming back to table 4.1. So table 4.1 gives us the exact solution for n equal 1 to infinite. But if we take this now into consideration, if we take that into consideration and reconsider table 4.1, then we can write down for a large plane wall, take note, a large plane wall, we can write that the solution of theta, and I'm going to use a little bit a different nomenclature that is used in the textbook. I'm going to put in an x there to indicate it's a function of x. Okay. The theta can then be written as the temperature minus t infinite divided by ti minus t infinite is equal to a how many A terms? Only the first term. E to the minus lambda. Which term? Only the first one. Uh, lambda squared tau, something like that, multiplied by the cos of lambda 1, multiplied by x divided by L, and that is equation 4.23 in your textbook. So equation 4.23, 24 and 25 are specifically for the first term only. Okay, if tau is larger than 0.2. So it also has an equation for the long cylinder theta which is a function of r and take note, in that equation is the Bessel function, zero. And then there's also the one for the sphere. And again, the theta is given as a function of r for a sphere and for the cylinder. And there's a j1 in that equation. And this equation is 4.24. And that equation is 4.25 in your textbook. So they are summarized there all together for the one term solution only. If typically tau is larger than 0.2. Now in many problems you're going to start and it will not be clear what tau is. But what you're then going to do is you're just, just going to say I hope it is larger than that. You're going to work through it and see what the answer is. And then based on the answer you're going to say yes, it was a good assumption or not. Okay. Okay. Now there's another category of problem which is very specific cases and that is for the solution at the center only. Okay. So this, if we look at the three cases, the sphere, 
then in many problems we are interested in ex what is happening exactly in the center. Okay, where x is equal to zero and where r is equal to zero. And if you go and do the substitution in these equations, then again you get three equations for the large plane wall, the long cylinder and the sphere, and they are given in your textbook equations 4.26, 4.27 and 4.28. And then just after that, there are also equations which are written as the ratio, the wall divided by the ratio at the center. Three equations and they are, are all summarized as equation 4.29. And there's a specific reason why that is done and I'm going to show it to you later. Okay. So, the other table that is now also important is table 4.2. And let me see if I can show that to you. This equation of table 4.2, if you can take a look at it again, unfortunately it is very small. But if you look carefully, you're going to see the following, the table. Firstly, on this side of the table is different built numbers. Okay. Then, the table is divided into three groups. The long plane wall, the long cylinder and the sphere. The three different geometries. And for each one of them, the values are given of lambda 1 and A1. Lambda 1 and A1, Lambda 1 and A1. Okay. It means that if you've got the build number which is equal to 5, as we've considered previously, then Lambda 1 would be equal to 1.3138. Okay. You can get it from there and you can also get the constant from there. So that is a very handy table. The next one is table 4.3. Table 4.3 gives for certain values of eta the Bessel function 0 and the Bessel function 1. And then students in the test and exam would say, now what is this eta? Where does it come from now? Okay. So eta is just the case, if you want to calculate, for example, J0 of lambda n multiplied by R divided by RC, let me just get another color. Then everything here in brackets is equal to lambda. So if you work this out and this value is equal to 1, then it is where n eta is equal to 1 and then you can get the value j0 from the table. Let me see if it is there. If you can focus there for us on the screen also please, um, Tamron. Then you'll be able to see all the j0 and j1 values. Is that clear to you? Now, there's also graphical solutions. And again, the graphical solutions is for the cases where tau is larger than 0.2. So it's only for the first term. And these graphical solutions are called Heisler charts. And they are shown in figures 4.17, 4.18 and 4.19 for the three different geometries, the large plane wall, the cylinder and the sphere. And typically they look like this. It's graphs of theta zero as a function of time four different values of one divided by the build number. Okay. So for any problem, 
if you want to know at a certain non-dimensionalized time and at a certain build number, you can get theta zero. What does theta zero mean? It means at the center, okay? Specifically at the center of the body. Then the next graph is going to help you if you now want the temperature at another position than the center. Now it's going to give you the results for theta divided by theta zero as a function of one divided by the build number for different values of x divided by L or for R divided by R zero. So if you want the temperature at another position than the center, then you first have to, have to get this one, then you can substitute it in that one. Okay. And from there, then you can calculate the temperature at any other point. Okay, and then the last graph is the one of Q divided by Q max. Okay. The number of joules that has been transferred, not the heat transfer rate, but the number of joules as we've discussed with lecture one. And typically the results are a function of build one square multiplied by tau, and they are also given for different values of build number. Okay. What is Q max? Q max is equal to MCP multiplied by T infinite minus TI because that is the maximum temperature distribution at the beginning. Okay. So that is the maximum number of joules that can be transferred. Please do not confuse it with the heat transfer rate, which we are going to actually after chapter four, we're normally just going to use this one, and that is equal to the mass flow rate Cp multiplied by delta T. Okay. And that one will be in watts. So let me see if I can show you quickly the graphical solution typically for the Eisler charts. This is typically how the Eisler charts look like. I know you can't may maybe see it, but if you look in your textbook, it gives in this case the solution of theta zero as a function of time for different build numbers. Also take note, they give you a sketch there that gives you exactly what L is so that you do not get confused. Okay. So do not use the L or the LC of the lump system approach. It tells you exactly what L to use. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It's the end of this lecture.